tonight. And they sort of say, well, what's wrong with um, investing uh, in the system? What's wrong with smaller class sizes? Support for job action from teachers across the country and locally, according to new data. Also, trapped in Gaza, a man in Saskatoon is looking for help to bring over his family. Plus, a Regina family is hitting all the right notes as a longtime band instructor is passing the baton onto his children. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Tuesday, February 20th, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thanks for watching. While students are off on a February break, Saskatchewan teachers are getting support in their fight over classroom size and complexity. Teachers from BC, Ontario and New Brunswick joined the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation in solidarity during a news conference today. The STF says classroom issues here have been addressed in collective agreements elsewhere. Saskatchewan teachers want to negotiate class sizes and complexity or support for student issues. The government has refused, saying it should be dealt with at the local school board level. Ontario elementary teachers were able to include supports for students with complex needs in their agreement. In BC, provincial and local agreements include class size, staffing ratios and class composition. Classroom complexity is a new reality for all teachers regardless of province. When educators are required to support so many complex needs in the classroom, that they become stretched beyond capacity, every student's learning experience is impacted. When classes are too big, or there aren't enough staff to help students with diverse needs, our most vulnerable students are often the first to lose the programs and services they depend on. But when teachers have manageable workloads, our students benefit. It's not only other teacher federations showing support. A new poll from Incitrix reveals the majority of parents surveyed in the province also stand with teachers. 63% of parents with kids affected are still in favour of job action. 10% of those parents were neutral and 27% were against teachers taking further measures. The support was similar for those without kids. In a statement, the province said they're at the bargaining table in Regina waiting for teachers to return. Students across the province are on a break, as mentioned, and more job action is expected when classes resume next week. The mayor of Davidson says the entire community is distraught with loss. On Sunday, a house fire killed five members of the same family. Police have not released the names of the people who died. Shlok Talati has more. The tight-knit community of Davidson was hit by a tragedy Sunday. Five people died in a house fire in this town between Regina and Saskatoon. The RCMP says an 80-year-old man and an 81-year-old woman were taken to the hospital where they were pronounced dead. Once the fire was extinguished, they found three more children. On Monday, the house was covered with police tape, the roof was collapsed and the windows were bolted up. We don't know the cause of the fire yet and the RCMP says it's still investigating. Shlok Talati, CBC News, Davidson. Now, many in the community have declined to speak with the media, and that includes the chief of the local fire department. About 90% of the 120,000 firefighters in Canada are volunteers, and that includes the department in Davidson. The president of the Canadian Volunteer Fire Services Association says that's because the effects on a community can be significant. Everybody in the community is going to be very well and strongly affected on this, including the firefighters, RCMP, EMS, uh, coroners, and right down to the local funeral directors in their community. So it's uh, going to be a community thing as well. Uh, for the fire department, firefighters that are responding to the call, it could be anybody from a SaskTel employee to a plumber to a business owner to just a, a worker general in our town. It could be a grocery store owner or a manager of the credit union or a bank. Everybody that's involved in the community is going to be probably involved in our, in our local fire departments. Starkel says everyone in the department and the community will need care and attention as a result of this fire. Autopsies will be done in Saskatoon this week, but after some investigation, our CMP have said the fire was not suspicious and there will be no further updates. A Saskatoon judge has started hearing the defense's case at Greg Furtuck's first-degree murder trial. 
Furtuck is charged in the death of his wife, Sherry, who vanished in 2015. Pratush Jayal reports. After many delays, an end might be near in the trial of Greg Furtuck. Furtuck is representing himself in a trial where he's accused of killing his wife, Sherry, in 2015. Her body was never found. On Tuesday, Furtuck was expected to call a gun expert, but he told the court he didn't have enough money to call any expert witnesses. Instead, he questioned previous witnesses. That included Darren Sorotsky. He's Sherry's younger brother who worked with her in the family gravel business. Furtuck questioned Sorotsky about what he knew about Greg and Sherry's relationship. He asked Sorotsky if Greg had shown any animosity to her. Sorotsky said he doesn't have an answer. Furtuck also questioned Morris Bodnar, his previous lawyer. He asked Bodnar about Mr. Big Stings and the delays of the trial so far. The last witness to be called was Sherry's neighbour, Robert McJanet. It was his first testimony in this trial and Furtuck asked him about the events surrounding Sherry's disappearance. On many occasions, Furtuck was reminded by Justice Richard Danilik on how to question witnesses and avoid commentary. At one point, Danilik even said, and I quote, We are not in a playground. This is a very serious matter. In September, Justice Danlick ruled that a 2019 video confession that Greg made to undercover police can be used as evidence. In that confession, Greg described killing his wife. On Tuesday, Furtuck told the court he doesn't want to testify and that he needs time to put together closing arguments. Court is adjourned until Wednesday morning. On that day, Furtuck will confirm whether or not he will testify. The court is hoping to have closing arguments by next week. Pratish Tayal, CBC News, Saskatoon. A Saskatoon man is desperately trying to bring his family trapped in Gaza to Saskatoon. His communication with them has been minimal, and the number of visas being offered are capped at just 1,000. Liam O'Connor has more. Ahmed Koudé came to Saskatoon last February as a refugee after fleeing from a city in Gaza called Kanunas. His journey to Canada has taken years. Before arriving here, he lived in Turkey. That's while Gil Nemeth, her husband, and a local organization, Nest, were working to bring Kuday to Saskatoon. The application process took two and a half years. I knew from my conversations with Ahmed that he yearned, he was stuck. He was stuck there. Uh, his life was stuck. Um, there was no way for him to move on. Now Kude is a permanent Canadian resident. He's desperately trying to bring more of his family to the city. And at last word, his family was heading to Rafah, where hundreds of thousands of Palestinians have been pushed to escape Israeli attacks in the region. Through a translator, we asked him how he's holding up. Kude says he's devastated with what's happened and asks if this is a dream. He can't sleep. Um, he's always thinking about what's, ha what, what's going to happen to his family in, in, in Gaza. It has been a disastrous situation for him at the mental level and I know at the physical level as well because I've been helping him. Kude is one of many Canadian Palestinians who have applied for the temporary resident visas being offered for people trapped in Gaza. But there are only 1,000 visas being offered. Now we turn to Gaza and we see a, a, a cap of 1,000 um, and it, it's frankly, shocking in face of, in view of the, the, the absolute dire conditions that Palestinians are facing um, in Gaza today. Aiken says there are inconsistencies in visa programs. She says Canada gave out almost a million temporary resident visas to people fleeing the Ukraine-Russia war. For now, it's a waiting game for Kude. It's been more than a month since he filed applications to bring his three brothers here, but he still hasn't heard anything back. Liam O'Connor, CBC News, Saskatoon. Premier Scott Moe is back in India on a trade mission. The province announced the expedition this morning. The goal is expanding trade, attracting investment, and highlighting Saskatchewan's role in global food and energy security. The Premier posted photos to social media of himself in various meetings. It's Moe's third trip to India since being sworn in as Premier in 2018, and it's an expense that the official opposition says is unnecessary. It's a five, maybe six figure trip to a country that the premier has already been to three times, that this government has been to seven times, a government who just got back from a lavish million dollar week in Dubai, 
and can't seem to keep their feet on the ground long enough to actually focus on the work of governing this province. The last six trips have cost Saskatchewan a total of $232,000. The cost of this latest one is not known yet. The government maintains India as an important trade partner with an estimated $1.3 billion exported there in 2023. The NDP says there's no doubt that India is important, but that Mo should be back in Saskatchewan dealing with domestic affairs. Canada's annual inflation rate slowed in January. It's now 2.9%, down from 3.4% in December. A drop in the price of gas was the main thing pushing the rate down. Grocery prices are cooling too. High mortgage in interest costs continue to drive inflation up. Rent is also a factor. Economists say rent prices will continue to go up due to population growth and a housing shortage. But they expect the Bank of Canada to begin cutting its key in lending rate by June. A gorgeous day in Saskatoon. What a lovely week for the kids to be off school and get outside. It looks like we're in for more of the same as the week rolls on. Tyreek Reed will have more on your forecast after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. For decades, the Olympics have faced the problem of athletes using performance enhancing drugs. But what if it wasn't a problem? What if there was a competition where currently banned substances were allowed, even embraced? If that sounds far-fetched, here's more from Jamie Strashen. Canada's figure skating team in Beijing played by the rules. But even after a doping scandal, they were beat out by Russia. Why have I done this my whole life cleanly and correctly, the right way? The enhanced games are real. Now a new company's trying to change the game. We want athletes who have the potential to break world records and give them the opportunity to push the limits of humanity. I am the fastest man in the world. Self-described as the Olympics of the future, the enhanced games would allow athletes under clinical supervision to take substances currently banned. I don't think that athletes want to be the fastest natural man in the world. They just want to be the fastest. Backed by big money, including PayPal founder Peter Thiel, it's also promising substantial compensation. But would any athlete actually participate? As far as my athletic peak, history says that it's behind me. The enhanced games say it's not. Let's find out. 32-year-old Australian swimmer and Olympic silver medalist James Magnuson is the biggest name to express interest. I'm going to do this with the best doctors and medical professionals in the world to make sure that I'm doing it safely and properly. But most in the sporting world have ridiculed the idea. I think it's a horrific message. Including the head of Canada's anti-doping agency. There may be challenges or possibilities for improvement to the anti-doping regime. The answer to that is not to throw it away and suggest people compete using drugs. We've cut through the water with unmatched speed. Others call the idea preposterous, although it's hoped the potential competition forces the IOC to give athletes a greater financial stake in the Olympics. I really hope that what we are starting to think about is how we reward our Olympic athletes. The enhanced games will feature events like swimming and track and promises in inaugural games in 2025. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. The weather update is brought to you by Capital GMC Buick Cadillac. Level Up Your Ride event is on now. And our weather specialist, Tyreek Reed, joins me now. It has been weirdly warm for February. Oh, yeah, Sam. Very, very warm, especially in southwestern parts of the province. Seeing temperatures above zero in places like Maple Creek and Shaunavan, and also above seasonals. So, you know, they had a daytime high in Maple Creek at around 5 degrees today. Usually around this time of the year, it'll be around minus 1 degrees. A little bit cooler in Swift Current at 3 degrees today, but still above zero zero and above seasonal usually around this time of the year they should be around minus three degrees 
Not the same story up north for our friends there in Collins Bay, currently sitting at around minus 18 degrees, so a bit colder there, of course. Stony Rapids around the same thing, minus 17 degrees. But as we head further south into central and southern parts of the province, we are actually above seasonal here in Regina, sitting at minus 5 degrees. Same situation for Saskatoon. Our friends there at around minus 4 currently. And this seems to be the same picture throughout much of central and South Saskatchewan. Now, as we look into tonight, we will see fog patches moving in. It's a very different story from the clear skies that we saw today, but I do want to point out this low pressure system that's moving in from the Northwest Territories into Northern Saskatchewan. This is going to bring light snow their way. Um, not too much accumulation. They will be looking at around two centimeters of um, snow in Stony Rapids, but that will move out as we head into Thursday. But we will start to see a very similar system heading down south into places like Regina as well. Now, with these fog patches that I mentioned, we will start to look at low visibility heading in through the night, such as right here in Swift Current. And as we head into the morning, these fog patches will linger a little bit, but they should clear out heading into the afternoon. Now, winds have not been that much of an issue for us today. We did see those gusty winds throughout much of last week and into the long weekend. But as we head further into the week, they will pick up in southern Saskatchewan, seeing gusts at around 30 kilometers an hour. But heading further into the week, speaking of that, we will see temperatures improve significantly here in Regina. We'll get above zero throughout the week, such as on Thursday and Friday, sitting at five degrees on Friday, even seven degrees on Sunday. Heading into the week ahead, we'll see temperatures drop a bit on Tuesday, sitting at around minus eight with those winds gusting at around 40 kilometers an hour at some points. Saskatoon, a bit of the same story for our friends here. They'll be sitting at around one degrees heading into Thursday, above that freezing mark and above zero. Heading into the weekend, those temperatures will remain with us as well in Saskatoon, but they will start to drop a little bit heading into the week ahead on Tuesday. We'll see a high at around minus 13, so a bit cooler, but Sam, for right now, it's looking very warm. We have absolutely nothing to complain about. Nothing to complain we about. We use a little snow, but temperature-wise, we've been pretty lucky. We are very lucky. I'm really happy about it. <laughs> Thanks, Tyreek. Thank you, Sam. Music was always the background track to this family's life, both parents working as band directors. Now in his 41st year of teaching, Brent Giglioni is proud his grown children are passing their own passion for music on to the next generation. When we come back, we'll learn more about how this family is influencing local music. Stay with us. The University of Regina has a new band for young musicians, and the driving force behind it is a dad and daughter duo. Florence Wong has the story of how the love of music is being passed on from one generation to another. Brent Giglioni has been a music teacher and a band director for 40 years. His daughter, Kira, never planned to follow in her father's footsteps. But looking back at her childhood, it was meant to be. I just would run around the house tooting on a mouthpiece. I didn't know that kids don't know jazz standards and, and listen to big band music all the time. So it just felt really normal. And Brent inherited his love for music from his father. He'd play all by ear in, in the basement because he was, he was not the greatest player. And, but he loved it. And then I started in a community band in Musha with the Musha Lions Band with, with all of my buddies. And that was uh, at eight years old. And there, from there, it's, it just took off. He became a beloved music instructor in Regina and the driving force behind several elementary and high school bands. We started them in grade six and we worked through them to the end of grade 12 and our attrition rate going from grade eight to grade nine was almost nil. And we really got a chance to, to be with these awesome people, young people. And um, they became more than just students, I think. 
And while Kira loved music, it wasn't her first career choice. In high school, I was like, I'm not going to be a teacher. Like, that's not for me. Like, anything but. And then I went into justice studies here at the university, and then I was doing more music stuff anyway. And so it just made sense to do the switch. And it was definitely the right choice. And just being able to work with kids and make that connection and and like grow a community of like music lovers has been the best. Kira is now finishing off a music education degree and her dad is the director of bands at the University of Regina. Together with another teacher, Kathy Anderson, they decided to form a junior wind ensemble for grades seven and eight. So the, the call went out in, in uh, was it December? In, in, in December, and then next thing you know, we're, they had 80 people show up. And so we, we, we had, I mean, that, that little band's like 62, 63 students and, and another, um, another 20 plus on a wait list. And, and um, so it's, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful little group. The band meets Saturday mornings in the music rehearsal room at the University Student Center. Cadence Hiroshi plays trombone. It's definitely um, cool to work with different people, all, definitely like all around Regina and stuff. And um, just meeting new people in general that play instruments is really cool as well. Alto saxophonist Alex Benish says everyone really wants to be here. Well, I feel like the people here are a little more like, I don't know, dedicated, I guess, because they have to get up at nine on a Saturday, which is kind of difficult for kids. Brent is encouraged to see band make a comeback post-pandemic. Last year we saw the, the rebound of, of, of bands, certainly within the city in southern Saskatchewan, I mean, they're, they're bursting at the seams again, you know, which is, which is great. Are you taking top or bottom? Yes. <laughs> and it gives the father-daughter team more ways to make music together. It's pretty exhilarating when you work with someone and they get it. Both my parents are awesome teachers and I've learned so much from both of them and I feel like they have taught me how to be a great teacher or how to um, connect with students and like make sure that you're providing the best education possible for kids. And now Kira is passing on the love of music that her dad gave to her. Florence Wong, CBC News, Regina. And Tyreek is back with one last look at your weather. Here in Regina, temperatures will drop to around minus 6 tonight. With those wind chills, it'll feel more like minus 12. Heading into tomorrow morning, we'll see temperatures at around minus 7 with lots of sunshine. And as we head into the afternoon here in Regina, those will warm up to around minus 4 with that sunshine sticking around. Now in Saskatoon, a bit of a similar story. We'll be at around minus 9 with mostly clear skies, with the exception of those fog patches that we spoke about earlier. As we head into tomorrow morning, temperatures will drop to around minus 12, but those sunny skies still sticking with us and warming up to around minus 4, Sam. All right. Thanks, Ty. You bet. And that is it for us tonight for News Anytime. You can head to our website, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or download the CBC News app. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.